everybody, it's Noah, and I'm here with Heather and Allison, we're with Midsummer's Music, and we are presenting our third Coffee Talk of the season, and we're excited to have Heather, our resident flautist, um, flautist extraordinary of Milwaukee Symphony, um, so you, you see her all throughout Wisconsin, and we're excited to have her a part of Midsummer's Music, and giving our talk live, fresh, off the press for you. Um, at the comfort of your home. So please, Heather, take it away. Thanks so much, Noah. That was a great introduction with this fresh coffee he's got there too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm so pleased to be back here at Midsummer's. It's always so much fun to play with colleagues and experience the beauty of Door County. And this is the fourth summer I've been here and I'm really having a blast. Um, and when they asked me to do a coffee talk, I started thinking, well, Let's see, what can I talk about? Mus lots of music things. And I decided to talk about something that I've become passionate about in the last year or so. Um, two things that are kind of, two kind of disciplines that are interrelated. And I keep discovering more ways that they're interrelated, which is Taoism and Alexander Technique. Um, so I, just as a disclaimer, first of all, this is not a comprehensive view of either of these disciplines, I'm really just a beginner, um, and I'm learning a lot along the way. And um, I just wanna share what I've learned with you. So first I'll start by saying like why. Why am I in interested in all this stuff? I'm a flute player, um, and playing music as a profession is highly rewarding, as you're sharing a wonderful tradition of art with people like you, and you're collaborating with colleagues in ways that not many other disciplines allow. For example, you can communicate musically with someone who doesn't even speak the same language. Um, but with all these wonderful things comes a set of challenges. It's physically demanding. Mastering and maintaining general technique takes hours per day of rapid finger work and sustained muscle contractions and performance under pressure with the need to sit or stand still for many hours. Um, and while you're doing this, you're putting your body in sometimes awkward positions and the flute is one of the more awkward ones. The viola can also get really awkward out there with that left hand, but with the flute, we've got this turn of the head and a little bit of a turn that way. And then the left arm has quite a um, crook in it that way. It's not a straight arm. So, you know, this feels good for a little while, but think about doing this for hours a day while you're having your muscle contractions and lots of rapid finger work. It can actually be pretty difficult on the body. So uh, playing music professionally is also psychologically demanding because you have to perform at an extremely high level. Um, like I usually play with an orchestra during the year. You've got the pressure of playing for the conductor and the audience and your colleagues. And that pressure that sometimes we put on ourselves, we are usually our own worst critic, but it's akin to competitive sports. So a lot of times we read books in like sports psychology to learn their methods of dealing with it. And I've found that both Alexander Technique and Taoism has helped me a lot with both the physically physical demands of the music and the psychological demands. So why did I discover this now? Well, uh, I spent the first 25 years of playing the flute with basically no, no physical issues in spite of these high demands. But then by the end of last summer, so almost a year ago, I began feeling pain in my wrists and forearms and sometimes even some tingling in my fingers. And that was really scary. Never, I'd never experienced anything like that before. But after seeing multiple doctors, massage therapists, an acupuncturist, a chiropractor, and I got some lab work done and an MRI, um, just to rule out systemic disease or mechanical issues that could be happening, really the, the only true relief I felt was from lessons in the Alexander Technique. Um, it's more of a whole body experience that I just wasn't getting from the other, you know, going to the doctors, they said, there's nothing wrong with you. It's, you, you still have plenty of mobility and I could still play the flute, but there was just, there was pain every time. But Alexander Technique has really helped with that, managing that and finding new ways to deal with it. So 
what is the Alexander Technique? According to the American Society for the Alexander Technique, the Alexander Technique is an educational method used worldwide for well over 100 years. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's your 50 minutes ago. No one was upstairs when oh, I talked. No. Did I have the wrong day? I thought I'll come back. Well, one welcome. Time. And you guys are down Glad here. Glad you're here. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. But no worries. Love it. Go ahead. Yeah, grab some coffee. <laughs> and lots of donuts. Yeah. So, yeah, we're just getting started. Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm going to talk about Alexander Technique first. Oh, no. So, I was listening just a little bit yeah. outside here, so I got the drift. No worries. My well. apologies. Yeah, no problem. So, I, first, I'm going to give like the textbook definition of what it is because people are sometimes bewildered. What in the world? Well, is it posture? Is it relaxation? What is it? So the, the definition from the American Society for the Alexander Technique is the Alexander Technique is an educational method used worldwide for well over 100 years by teaching how to change faulty postural habits. It enables improved mobility, posture, performance, and alertness along with relief of chronic stiffness, tension, and stress. So basically, it's a teaching method that uses a combination of verbal directions and hands-on work to enable the student to gradually improve their approach to moving through the world and preparing for to face life's challenges. And an important word in there is we are considered students. It, it took me a little while to get used to that. If you go to a massage session or something, you, you call it a session. and and they're, you know, somebody's doing the work to you. But in this case, you're learning something and you can practice it on your own. And you truly are a student. And that's one of the things that I've gotten really excited about is I've been out of school for like 12 years now and I get to be a student again and have, and have lessons. And I, I'm lucky that I have two wonderful Alexander Technique teachers and I'm seeing them a couple times a week. It's really fantastic. So students learn how to get more in touch with their nervous system, muscular system, and skeletal system. So I'm going to use a little bit of this chalkboard um, since it's here, which is pretty cool. The main components of Alexander Technique, um, let's see here. You want to find the um, natural balance and coordination and poise of that of a child. Again, it's not just like relaxing your muscles. It's a, it's a little bit more specific than that. Poise is a great word to think about you're ready for action instead of just like slumped in a chair and that totally relaxed. Okay, but I'll go more into detail in a little bit. Um, next component is um, you're going to inhibit. Your, your habitual response to a stimulus. And then you direct yourself in a more efficient way. So um, before we get into more of the, the details of that, I just want to talk about who this method is named after. So Frederick Matthias Alexander Maybe I'll write his dates up here so you can see this. He lived from 1869 to 1955. And he was an Australian actor. He specialized in reciting Shakespeare. And what happened was he began experiencing laryngitis whenever he would perform. Um, it, there were great demands on the vocal cords to be able to project, and they didn't have microphones yet then, of course. Um, so it, he went to see a lot of doctors, and they couldn't help him. They would suggest something like, maybe we should do surgery. But would you want doctors in the 1800s doing surgery on your, on your larynx? Oh, that sounds pretty scary. So um, when the doctors couldn't help him, he discovered a solution on his own. He had previously not been aware that excess tension in his neck and body were actually causing his problems. And so what he did was he spent, I think it took him years actually, 
looking in front of a mirror while reciting and noticing there were like subtle little bits of tension creeping into his neck that he just didn't know about. And it, it wasn't a problem if he was just having a conversation with his friends or family. It was just when he was reciting. So with this diligent work, he was able to find new ways to speak and to move with greater ease. His health improved to such an extent that his friends and several of the doctors he had seen before persuaded him to teach others what he had learned. And he, he was able to help people find more freedom much more quickly than he could because as he knew what he was doing, he started using his hands and helping them find ways to open up and be more free. It was much quicker than just looking in front of a mirror. So over a career span of more than 50 years, he refined his method of instruction and teaching for over 35 years, he began to train teachers of what has now become known as the Alexander Technique. So now, as promised, I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, so with the finding this balance, coordination of poise of a child, this is a huge part of it. It's, we're trying to find our natural balance rather than like forcing something or you know, forcing a stretch. Um, so in the Alexander Technique, the body is seen as an integrated whole rather than a sum of like individual parts. Everything is literally connected to everything. It's not, it's not just this weird um, thing where, where it's like, well, what are they talking about? It doesn't make any sense. There's actually scientific evidence of this. Um, some scientists have like cut up cadavers and found out that the fascia, the connective tissue from your eyebrows is literally connected all the way around your skull, down your back, down your legs, to the bottom of your foot. So it's like connected from your eyebrows to your big toe in one line, which is pretty wild. I didn't know about that before. So there's a lot of scientific evidence behind why it would make sense to see the body as a whole. Our body's response to gravity is a prime way of existing in the world, along with other basic functions like breathing and eating. So if we think of our spine as um, a spring, where gravity puts the load on the spring and then our muscle tone counteracts that load. So if you can think about the Newton's third law of motion, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, the gravity is a constant, it's always gonna be there. It's always putting the load. Our spines are, are naturally gonna be able to come, the, the vertebrae kind of come away from each other when, when we allow there to be space and we can, gradually come up away from the gravity. So if you think about that, it becomes clear why that natural lengthening of the spine happens when we stand upright. So children, I, I mentioned, we're trying to find this balance coordination of, and poise of a, of a child. Small children typically have beautiful posture because with the relatively large size of their heads and the, their lack of muscle development, they have to be able to hold themselves upright in an efficient manner. There's just no way around it. And they haven't had time yet to develop postural habits that interfere with their natural poise, like, you know, <laughs> doing their dishes, driving. Like we tend to really, this is like the extreme of what we tend to do in our society. And children hopefully are not, <laughs> not getting into those sorts of positions yet. Um, so also, Alexander Technique talks a lot about the interplay between what they call primary, or what's a lot of times referred to as flexion, kind of, it's like internally rotating the joints, and what they call secondary, or extension, or sometimes we'll say externally rotating the joints. And there's an interplay, and the, the spine already has some natural curves, which I'm sure everybody knows about that already. Um, this is a little bit secondary in the cervical spine, a little bit primary in the thoracic spine, and a little secondary, again, in the lumbar spine. So those are natural curves, but they're, they're, there's like infinite ways that we could have primary and secondary throughout the body. And children seem to be really good at going between them and rebalancing. So if they go to pick up something, there might be a little bit of primary, and then when they get up, there's more secondary, but they don't stay up here, they rebalance. 
So it's, it's very fascinating like, to watch toddlers when, when they've just started learning how to walk and how they balance their head and how they can move that way. And a lot of ways to get in and out of primary and secondary has to do with spiraling the body too. And our, our bodies are, are very much built in spirals. That's how we can stand up um, or else you would probably just fall over if you were just thinking of a line. But like the, the legs spiral inwards to hold you up and then through the back, this again with the, the fascia connective tissue, it kind of spirals from side to side and that can help you. So maybe what we can do is let's, let's try a little exercise um, so that we can experience the primary and secondary. So you can still sit in your chair. I'll sit in the chair too. So this is one of the components that's um, in a lesson. You'll usually spend some time standing, sometimes sitting in a chair, and a lot of time like going between standing and sitting because that's something we do all the day and it can be tricky. Um, so yeah, so just sit up kind of on the edge of your chair. And um, we're going to think about rotating yourself in, not even like a, a physical way. Think about your heartbeat. Maybe put your hand on, on your heart and close your eyes. And as you think inwards, we're, we're really tapping into the inner parts of our bodies. Just let your shoulders start to come forward. Let your head move forward. The crown of the head is going forward. And then let your spine follow the head so that you actually start to bend all the way over into your lap. You keep thinking, maybe you haven't felt your heartbeat yet, but feel for that. So it's very comfortable, way inwards. Now, you hear the snapping. As you hear the snapping, open your eyes and allow your head and your, like following from your eyes opening, allow your head to come up towards the snaps. I'll move it around so everybody can feel this. So your head's coming up and how does the rest of your body come up with your head? Do you start to feel like you wanna rise out? It's like if you wanted to reach towards the sound, you, this doesn't work very well. Instead, secondary is the natural way to get out of it. So you want to try it again? It, this, it, it took me a long time to really understand how to do this. Um, so, so go way down into primary again. You're very in, in the very internal world here. And then open your eyes and reach for this sound with your eyes first and your head. And then maybe even reach an arm up. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm really seeing some good secondary here. <laughs> Doesn't that feel good? And what if it was, I'm not tall enough to get it really high, but... Okay, and now, work on trying to rebalance yourself. This is what can be tricky. Because it's like, I don't want to be stuck like this. I don't want to be stuck like this either. But next time you see a toddler, notice how, how good they are at this. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, so I'll move on to the second um, major component of Alexander technique, inhibit. Inhibit a habitual response to a stimulus. So this can get confusing because we tend to think of the word inhibit or an inhibition as a negative feature because it sounds like it's in opposition to freedom. But what's meant here is to take the time to pause rather than allowing our habitual action to take place. So it's like um, you have to get out of your own way because sometimes when, um, when we hear something or we have some kind of, you know, the phone rings, something like that, you tense up and you run for the phone and that sort of thing happens. That's not great for your body. I don't know. So some people probably do this more than others, but I know that I've, and the habitual, really high response to things. So it's about um, stopping the wrong thing from happening because that often allows the right thing to do itself. So if you, if you hear that phone ring, instead of tensing up, you can say to yourself, I have time. And then 
If you pause long enough, you can choose to take an action in a more coordinated way. So that brings us to the next one, because this, these kind of are interlinked in inhibition and direction. Once you've inhibited the habitual response, you can direct yourself to respond in a more efficient manner, or maybe not to respond at all, because sometimes that's the best thing. Um, but Alexander um, came up with these directions, which I'll, I'm going to write over here, if this will work fine, in shorthand. So going through these directions can help throughout the day, different um, stimuli, whatever is going on, can always help. Um, so I'll go through each one of them. The first is let your neck be free. So what's meant here is it's all about this atlanto-occipital joint. Everybody want to reach, reach back where your skull meets the top of your spine. It's like the very first uh, part of the spine, the vertebrae there. So this is the joint that enables you to shake your head, yes, yes, yeah, that's it. We want freedom there. We want as much space as possible. We don't want it to be closed in because that's gonna translate to greater freedom throughout the whole body. So here's where he does get a little bit specific. It, you know, it's mostly about dealing with the whole, but if you start with freedom here, it's, it's gonna help everything else. Um, so then, once the neck feels more free, you can allow the head to move forward and up. Again, this can sound confusing because, you know, the posture I was talking about earlier, where people are really like this, it's what our society tends to do is we're on our phones and everything. That looks forward, but the forward he's talking about has to do with the, the back of the neck staying back enough so that the whole head, the weight of the head, is forward on that atlanto-occipital occipital joint, or AO joint for short. So the weight, it's not like your head is one of those punching bag, you've ever seen one of those like round punching bag things that's on the, it's right in the middle of the hole. Your head is, the weight is forward of the joint and the column of the neck is back and it might feel forced to do that at first but it actually is naturally what our bodies want to do so that's the head and it's it's kind of like this direction this way okay so then the third one is let the back lengthen and widen and it, again they go in order once your head is moving forward and up that allows the back to, I'll show it this way, lengthen and widen. So it's supposed to be arrows. So it's just having this freedom here in the neck allows that space so that your back is elongating this way, but not so much that you sacrifice the width. It's all about the length and the width. Four. You're only going to be five of these, don't worry. <laughs> so many. Um, let the ribs move. So, as a wind player, I was taught mostly to breathe from the belly as, like to the, as a starting point, which is it's great because you can get a lot of air that way. But with Alexander Technique, I've been thinking more about really allowing the whole rib cage to move more rather than so much just at the belly. And in, in English, it's kind of, it's interesting that we use the word rib cage because it's not really a cage anyway, it's not rigid. The ribs can naturally move. So just try putting your hands on, on these floating ribs down here at the bottom and take a deep inhale. You feel how they really go out and go ahead and exhale. And we tend to think of them moving more like this way, like as a cartoon person breathing heavily, it would be like this, but they, they move more to the sides and even quite a bit to the back. And there's something about letting the, the ribs move like that 
that actually massages your abdominal muscles because the, the lungs go way down here and even into your collarbone, the lungs are all, all the way up here, they're pretty big. And if you just get out of the way instead of tensing up the torso and allow that to happen, that can help your freedom in your arms, freedom in your legs, your hips, everything's connected. If, if you have like a dog or a cat, it's amazing to watch when they're napping, when they breathe, it's not just like, it's not this little breath, like their whole body moves a lot of times. You'll see their legs moving while they're breathing. So I think we can learn a lot from, from watching our companion animals too, because it's just natural to them. They're not really thinking about it. And we're not thinking about it when we're sleeping either. And it's probably going to be a little more movement in a natural way while we're sleeping. Okay, so then the last one is, this is sometimes worded differently, but one way of wording it is let your knees go forward and away. I'll just write that. And your shoulders um, broaden. So another way of wording all of this is to don't stiffen your limbs, but that's a don't, so I, I kind of like the positive one better. So the, the knees, it's really important that they're, you're not locking and putting extra strain in your, your legs and hips. So if you, if you think of, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, lately, just walking, I think about my knees going forward and you almost feel like a Muppet or something. It feels like you're so loose and it makes your hips looser is really what it does. But that's the direction. It's just thinking of your knees going forward. And then your shoulders, instead of thinking like sit up straight and you know we do this, we pull our shoulders back, it's not really that. It's just they're going out. They're going straight out that way. So all of these directions are they're not doings, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about Taoism. We're not, you're not like forcing anything to happen. You're just allowing the body to naturally do what it wants to do in that response to gravity. Um, and if I was gonna sum it up, because this is, it sounds, it's a little complicated, you know, to have those five directions every time, you could sum it up with the word um, expand. So it's like, it's almost like you're a star and your whole body is expanding in every direction, but especially up because of the gravity, like putting that load on you all the time. So up or expand would be like the takeaway of those five directions. Um, so, since we were talking about um, not forcing it to happen, I want, I want to do this in a, a little exercise with everybody so you can experience what it's like just to think about a movement and how that can actually affect our muscles. So, um, again, we're going to put, put your hand on the back of your neck, like right under that AO joint we were talking about, and do you feel... Um, those thick muscles on either side of the spine, these are like super sensitive muscles. They're responsible for turning your head and making you tense when you're stressed out. No, we don't want that to happen, but they, they can tend to get really tense. So close your eyes, and as your hand is there, with your eyes closed, shift your, your eyeballs under your eyelids to the left, and then shift your eyes to the right and then bring them back to center, and then shift them up, and shift your eyes down. Okay, and now you can open your eyes. Did, does anybody want to share what happened, or did you feel anything in those muscles when that happened? Mine felt a little more relaxed when I was looking down, moving it. You felt, you felt your muscles relax when you, yeah. when you looked down? Yeah, looking up and tense up. Just yeah, yeah, right? Did anybody else experience anything? I think it feels like when I'm looking up, my muscles are tensing as if this had turned bigger than that too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Isn't a natural that wild? reaction. Yeah. Yeah. That's what can happen. And as, as did, did you have anything happen? No. Um, I I felt for some reason it was complicated to do the exercise with my eyes closed. That's my only feedback. Well, yeah, that's true too. <laughs> it is. Just, but yeah, we're trying to go internal here. And if, if a more subtle way of doing it is just. Think looking left, yes. think looking right, and sit in, you might not always feel that, but sometimes, even if I just think of it, I feel the muscles do something. 
So that shows you like how hardwired we are to, if we're thinking left, your, your muscle is, your, these, these complicated muscles in the back of your neck are so ready to like make your head turn that they're already tensing up. And so even with an, just a very small movement of the eyeball, the muscles are already trying to help you with something. So that demonstrates the power of the mind, just thinking about it can already make lasting differences. So when I go through these directions, I'm not going to do them as much. It's really hard because we're so used to like, okay, I want to be a good student. I want to be tall. I want the neck to be free. Be free, neck. But that's not very effective because then you can end up tensing up even more. You just think those directions. And the more you can think them, you can start to find the freedom that way. That way. OK, um, so there's just one other part of Alexander technique that I wanted to highlight. And that is the concept of end gaining. And what that means is using whatever means necessary to produce an end result. So this is huge for musicians because we often have to spend we have like a really limited amount of time to learn a piece of music. So we'll lock ourselves in a practice room, sometimes called the woodshed, we're woodshedding, just like working on the music until that passage is under our fingers. And we can often do more damage than good by that approach, uh, because if we're so focused on learning the notes, Sometimes we neglect to listen to our bodies and to take proper breaks and even to take proper mental breaks. And I, I also like gardening, so I, I really experienced a parallel with gardening here because I'll say things like, well, the more weeds I pull today, the fewer weeds I'll have to pull next week. So obviously, let's pull as many weeds as possible right now. But that's really dangerous because, again, you're, you're just focused on like finishing the task more than like paying attention to how that's affecting your body. And one of my Alexander Technique teachers also loves gardening, and she says what she does is she actually sets a timer on her phone when she goes out to pull weeds. So she's like, I'm gonna garden for 15 minutes. And when the timer goes off, done, it doesn't matter how many weeds are left, I'm done. So I'm trying to practice that too, because it, it's helpful. It's, you know, it doesn't matter that much. Um, what, I mean, of course, with music, you need to learn the notes, but you can find ways to organize your time if instead of saying, like, I'm going to practice until I know this well enough, you say, I'm going to practice this for 20 minutes, and then I'm going to take a break. I'll, I'll come back to it later. So it, it's just a, a different way of approaching learning something difficult or pulling weeds. So in the Alexander Technique world, the means whereby is more important than an end result. And that concept is like has a big parallel with Taoism too. So I'll move on to Taoism now after hydrating. <laughs> Why are you doing that? We take question? Yeah, of course. Go for it. As a flautist, I assume mm -hmm. everything is in your shoulders and neck. Because you're holding your instrument there, right? Well that's why So can you actually feel it if you just do a full half day of weeding? Can you actually note it in your performance? Does it actually affect? Oh yeah, oh it definitely does. Yeah, it, 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 any kind of um, intense arm workout is gonna. It's there's some similar things, you know, like even turning doorknobs. I was finding like, oh, that feels like that same pain when I'm playing the flute. Just it, it kind of fine motor things more mm -hmm. that, that, that puts pressure on the wrist. And our our hands are amazing. They can do so much, right? But if, if we tense up something like in the neck because we're in an awkward position, it's going to affect everything. Long distance yeah. driving. Long distance driving, totally. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely get irritated from that too. So think in those directions uh, the whole time I'm driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Continually. Right, yeah. There, there's so many things we can do to ourselves if we don't really pay attention and find that, that bit of freedom there. Yeah. In, any other questions before we move on? And we can always do more questions later, too. Cool. Okay. Because the reason why I'm bringing Taoism into this is I don't have a whole lot of experience with it. Um, I, I had read you know, a couple books a few years ago, and it was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. 
But then when I started taking Alexander Technique lessons, I kept seeing all these parallels of getting out of the way and you know, we'll, we'll get into it. And it's, it's just, it's kind of interesting. So what is Taoism? It's, it's an ancient Chinese philosophy. Sometimes it's considered to be a religion, but it's not a religion like Christianity. It doesn't, it, there aren't rituals like that for the most part. And it's kind of a, just a more of a way of thinking. Um, and it instructs people on how to exist in harmony with nature. So you see already, it's already seeming similar. It's like, get out of the way, let, let nature do its thing. So I wrote it up here. Um, it's generally spelled with a T today in English. I mean, of course, it's taken from classical Chinese. Um, sometimes you'll see D-A-O as well. Um, but it's pronounced Dao. It's closer to D, I guess, but usually spelled with a T. Um, so this, this Dao is difficult to define, but loosely it can be thought of as the way of the universe. And much of Taoist thought has its roots in this book called the Tao Te Ching, which um, if we're going to try to translate this, we've got the, the way of the universe, kind of the way. De means virtue, and Ching means book. So you could call it like the book of virtue or the way of virtue. It's kind of hard to translate. Um, but this book, it's... It's a book of 81 brief chapters. They're written like little poems. Like this, this is how, how small each of them are, but they're big ideas in them. Um, and the author of the text is thought to be, I'll write one spelling of his name here. Again, it can be spelled like this, or sometimes Lao Tzu. He may or may not have existed as a single person. It's, it's one of these, like even Shakespeare, we think there may have been multiple people writing his plays. Um, same with Lao Tzu, could have been a collection of philosophers. Um, but he or the group of people lived around 500 BC. So this is a text from 2,500 years ago. And it's one of the most widely translated books in the world. Even, even his name, it translates as the old master. So it was just, it was a name that he was given later when people were remembering this person or this collection of people. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that text. And then there's another important Taoist text that was that came a little bit later, um, known by the name of its author, Zhuangzi. And I'll write, this is kind of the more common English spelling of this. Zhuangzi. There's not really a name of the book. It's usually just called the Zhuangzi. And it's um, more of a collection of stories and a lot of times they're very humorous. And it's kind of a playful guide to living. So both of these texts uh, come from a period in Chinese history, what we call the Warring States period, where there was a lot of turmoil and um, it was before like the complete unification of China, so that's why there, there's so much thought came out of this because people were figuring out, well, how do we end this violence? There's got to be a better way to do it. And Confucius came out of that time as well, which I don't know quite as much about. It's more about ritual. This is more about nature, um, but there, it's very fascinating, and I look forward to learning even more about that period in history. So um, I just want to talk about the main components of Taoism that have helped me in my music. So the first one, where do I write over here, is to be like water. And there are two important ways that, that you could be like water. One is that the softness and supple, supple, suppleness of water overcomes the rigid. So if we think about, um, as like the physical part of that, if we think about um, water being like the softest thing that can, it can take the shape of anything pretty much, 
but also it can wear down rock over years of just being soft. So I'll, I'll just read the chapter from the Tao Te Ching that's, that talks about this, because it's really, it's beautiful. Um, this is a translation by Stephen Mitchell. Nothing in the world is as soft and yielding as water, yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible, nothing can surpass it. The soft overcomes the hard, the gentle overcomes the rigid. Everyone knows this is true, but few can put it into practice. Therefore, the master remains serene in the midst of sorrow. Evil cannot enter his heart. Because he has given up helping, he is people's greatest help. True words seem paradoxical. So basically, it's saying don't force your way into things. Don't put your will on people um, in, in your interactions. It's better to take a soft approach. And it's interesting that in, in our culture, we tend to frown upon flexibility. Like we don't want to say like, yeah, stay strong. Um, politicians are ridiculed for changing their position and say, oh, you flip flopped. And instead of seeing that as, oh, they're growing and learning. So it's, it's very interesting how we can react to that. So little by little, that soft approach will succeed over the rigid, more aggressive approach in this way of thinking. So another way that we can be like water is humility. It's like, how can water be humble? Well, I'll read another passage from the Tao Te Ching that illustrates that. This is from chapter 78, and again, it's the Stephen Mitchell translation. The supreme good is like water, which nourishes all things without trying to. It is content with the low places that people disdain. Thus, it is like the Tao. In dwelling, live close to the ground. In thinking, keep it simple. In conflict, be fair and generous. In governing, don't try to control. In work, do what you enjoy. In family life, be completely present. When you are content to simply be yourself and don't compare or compete, Everybody will respect you. So we all know the phrase, go with the flow, right? Um, that's a similar concept um, that actually the Stoics of ancient Greece believed in as well. There, there are parallels all over the world. It's interesting that when people meditate and do some serious thinking, a lot of times they come to similar conclusions. But let's stick with Taoism for now. The Tao is... It's this natural force, this, you know, I said the way of the universe. It's this flow of existence. If we follow the, vow, the, the Tao, like allowing ourselves to float down a river, tasks are easy, but if we try to resist the current, tasks are difficult and we can get in our own way. So in playing music, it's not effective to force our will on other people. We can have opinions, of course, but we need to be flexible and open to other people's interpretations. And that's gonna, it's gonna yield a, a more effective performance if the group gets along in that way. Especially playing in an orchestra. Because <laughs> if you have like a strong opinion and it's not what the conductor's opinion is, that's not gonna work very well. You're gonna have to go with the flow in the orchestra. Okay, so then another thing, I mean, I can talk about water all day, but we should go to the, the yin and the yang. So recognize the yin and yang in everything. So I want to show you, this is a little show and tell. Um, this is something I made when I was in elementary school. And I found it because my parents were cleaning out some old boxes of, of you know, projects and we kept everything, I guess. And I don't think I knew what the symbol meant then, but it was just cool to draw, it, to draw yin yangs and peace signs and that sort of thing. So I'll just show you the symbol that I made when I was in elementary school. So the concept is we've got two opposing forces and how they're interconnected. So the yin is represented by the dark color. It's usually black, but whatever. My creative elementary school self made it blue. There's the yin. And it became watery. 
I was thinking water. I must have, yes, and exactly, and the yin would be the water. So it's, um, the yin is basically representing receptivity, darkness, sometimes you could say femininity, but we don't mean like male and female when we say that. It's, it's just, it's more that recept receptive, dark, inactive um, type of state. And then the light color, <laughs> pink, of course, this is usually white, but that's the yang, which represents light and activity and something you could say masculinity, action. So that's the white. And then notice they're spiraled instead of like a straight line. So that's interesting, like we were talking about earlier with your bodies are spiraled. Everything in nature is spiraled. We don't have rigid lines. And um, there's a little bit of yang in the yin and a little yin in the yang as well to show how interconnected they are. So, um, uh, basically, I, I want to share a quote of, by philosopher Alan Watts that talks about flowers and bees and, and how they're interconnected to show that everything's basically interconnected. So he says, there's an interdependence of flowers and bees. Where there are no flowers, there are no bees. And where there are no bees, there are no flowers. They're really one organism. And so in the same way, everything in nature depends on everything else. So if you were gonna assign yin and yang to the flowers and bees, basically the, the flowers are mostly functioning as the yin, the receptive, just flower sitting here, come pollinate me. And the bees are the yang or the ac active part. I need to go gather nectar, and so I'm gonna go to a flower. But they both have components of both, and that's kind of the way everything works. Um, another example is a magnet with a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other. If you cut that magnet in half, you don't end up with a positive piece and a negative piece. Instead, you end up with two separate magnets that each have the positive and the negative sides. So it's the same with every duality. Each part only really has its meaning because of its relationship to the other part. And they each carry the other part within themselves as a potential. So um, we can even say that the, these components of the water in the, the first part of the water can be seen as yin and yang. And the softness and the suppleness is the yin. And the ability to erode rock over time is the yang. And they're, they're built within each other instead of being like separate. So my experience with this um, is I'm beginning to recognizing, recognize the opposing forces within myself and to be okay going back and forth between passive and active without judging one is bad and one is good. And this kind of thinking helps me with decisions I have to make, like knowing when to act and when not to. Or when that brings me to the next major component of Taoism, which is called Wu Wei. Let's work on here. Mm -hmm. Wu Wei can be defined as effortless action. Um, we can even think of it as non action. It kind of it sounds like it's an oxymoron a little bit. But. Um, I'll tell a story of a, a farmer to, to help illustrate this point. So there once was a novice farmer who planted his seeds in earnest and because he really wanted his, his crops to grow tall, he went outside every day and pulled on the sprouts, yanked on them, grow taller. And then he watered them twice as much as the experienced farmers around him told them that he should. But he really, again, he really wanted them to grow tall and strong, so he thought he needed to put more effort into it. So guess what happened to his crops? They totally failed. They were just, ugh, they withered away. And if he had just planted his seeds and basically left them alone until harvest time, nature would have taken care of everything. He made his crops fail by trying too hard to control them. So that's the Wu Wei. Um, in music, we, strive to do this and strive to do that or, ah, i want to try harder uh, but often resting and getting out of the music's way and out of your colleague's way 
can result in a more musical performance. And I think this concept is highlighted brilliantly in a book by the bassist Victor Wooten. Are you guys familiar with Victor Wooten? He's a founding member of the Bella Fleck and the Flecktones group. He plays a lot of different styles, jazz, bluegrass, funk. Um, but he's a very interesting person because he's also like really interested in nature and how nature is interwoven with music. And um, so I read this book by him called The Music Lesson. It's an amazing book. It has a lot of Taoist type of concepts in it. He doesn't, he doesn't like directly say that they are, but I feel like they're very connected to Taoism. And one thing that he says in the book is, don't try harder, try easier. <laughs> so it's, it's like that concept of if you're just forcing your way into trying to learn something and to play with other people, that's not gonna work as well as actually just, just making it easier by kind of going with the flow of the river we were talking about. So the pressure to win produces fear. The focus on winning and losing can overshadow your set of skills. Um, we can say you're, you're not in the zone, you're not in the flow state if you're thinking about that end goal. So this is kind of like the end gaming we were talking about earlier in Alexander Technique. Your mind can actually sabotage itself. If you you're have a performance, you're like, well, I don't know what the audience thinks, or I don't know, you know, what are the judges going to, what kind of um, comments are they going to give me? Then you're not even, you're not focused in that natural way of just letting the music flow. Um, so so there are a lot when of, people say, you've got nothing to lose, yeah, and, then you, you lose. and then you play more freely, right? Yeah, you're just, exactly. Just go for it. Yeah, right? well said. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So there are a lot of sports psychology books that, that kind of get into that, talking about that flow state. It, it's hard because, you know, of course we want to do a good job and often we're putting that pressure on ourselves. But if we can just try easier, <laughs> it often can really help because our, our bodies, especially if we have put the work in, you know, diligently over many years, we know how to do it. We just have to trust at that point. And that's, that's kind of that Wu Wei concept of effortless action. So um, there's just one other um, bit about Taoism I wanted to share from that other book um, that I was talk telling you about, the Zhuangzi. It's this book filled with um, humorous stories. Um, and it, what I've learned is you can be more open-minded by, by this book. There's so many stories about this. Instead of getting stuck on doing things in one way, there, there are other ways to think about things, other ways to do things. So um, this story I want to share is called Huizhe and the Gourd. And Huizhe is one of Zhuangzi's friends. He's like a logician, um, kind of a funny character. So in the story, Huizhe said to Zhuangzi, the king gave me a seed from a huge gourd. I planted it and the fruit ripened into gourds that weighed half a ton. I used one for a sauce jug and it was too heavy to lift. I split another into a ladle and there was no room in the house to set it down. It isn't that their size wasn't wonderful, but I saw they were useless, so I smashed them to pieces. So Zhuangzi replied, now you have a half ton gourd. Why didn't you think of making it into a big boat and sailing the rivers and lakes instead of worrying about having room in the house to set it down? Huizhe only thought of using the gourds in the way he knew, to hold water inside. He didn't think of using them in a new way, to hold water outside. So when one way of thinking doesn't work, try another way. You, in, they call this, in Taoism, they call this using the useless. <laughs> there are a whole lot of stories in this book about use, uselessness and how that can actually be useful in, in a different way. Um, and it, it might sound ridiculous to think about floating in a gourd, but I actually looked up pictures on the internet of they're like these pumpkin races. People actually carve out giant you know, pumpkins this big and they'll like float down the river with oars. And you've seen them? Oh yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, pumpkin That's racing. Have you done amazing. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Are you going to do well, it? Well, I, I, I want to go to it. I've seen it on YouTube, though. Yeah. There's so many videos. Yeah, it seems like maybe we could do it in Door County. 
But the well, pumpkins won't be that big until it gets really cold. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this summer's a new adventure. So it's a real thing, and it, it's just it's an interesting way of thinking of like floating on gourds. <laughs> in the By the way, they are going to do that next weekend. What? what? I'm sorry, two weekends. Here? They're doing a. Here they have where foam construct your boat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Please, yeah. Was there, was so foam maybe foam somebody foam? will do something with yeah. gourds. <laughs> Staying at Fresh Place, and he yeah. comes every okay. year for that. It's good to his whole high school. I think they did one of those in like, Milwaukee this past week. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 It's oh, I didn't even know about yeah. this. Okay. Yeah. It's very cool. It's very down. <laughs> So, um, so with the with this story and the other stories that I've read in that book, it's it's helping me gradually learn to be more open minded. I think musicians, maybe in particular, tend to be kind of closed minded. Like, oh, it's all about classical music, and I won't listen to that other type of music because it's in this category. Like, our, it's natural for human beings to kind of dice up everything into different categories, um, but. We don't have to do that all the time. We shouldn't, you know, it's like, don't judge a book by its cover. It's like that saying. Um, so I'm trying not to immediately judge something and say, oh, that's a music that I don't like category. Because that's like thinking in terms of rigid categories and that can really limit ourselves. So this, this book, the Zhuangzi, is filled with stories like this. And it's like a guide to living where you're, you're accepting your role in society. You don't have to like, like this, the Tao Te Ching, to truly live by what this says, you almost feel like you have to remove yourself from society. <laughs> and that's, that's, going, that's going pretty far. It, I think we can still learn a lot from it. Um, but the Zhuangzi almost has more applicable stories. Amazing, it was written like over 2,000 years ago that they can still be applied. And uh, I brought the version of the book that I have. I, I've also listened to a lot of lectures and read some things online, but this is, it's a book of, it's all cartoons. And it's this Zhuangzi, they, they translated it to the way of nature, but it's usually just called the Zhuangzi. And it's really cute with just the, the way the, the cartoonist brought about the emotions of the story. Lots of fun. Um, there's also, a book called Trying Not to Try by Edward Slingerland. Have you ever heard of this? It's really fantastic. Um, he's also kind of making a lot of this, um, you know, classical Chinese thought accessible to a modern Western world. Um, and, it, you know, just that concept, trying not to try. It's like, how do you do that? It's, it's, it's really tricky, but I, I would highly recommend that book as well. And that's pretty much it. Do you guys have questions about oh gosh, gosh, that's anything? That's so great. I, I, I really did not know very much about Tao. Um, so I, I really appreciate that you took us through that. That's, that's wonderful. I'd like oh, to know yeah. a lot more. Yeah, me too. I feel like I've really just scratched the surface of this too. And, and I just find it really a, a fascinating way to think about things. And that you're linking it to Alexander, that you're saying there's a correlation here. Yeah. That what we do in our own physical self is also our mental, right? Right. Well being and place. Yeah. 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 And Alexander is mental too. Is it, about seeing the body as a whole. They're seeing the mind as a whole too, and they're trying not to separate them. That's why when you think about moving, it's actually your muscles are already moving just thinking about it. Yeah. It's super fascinating. I think the link between the two that is most significant is the holistic notion of everything being integrated. Mm -hmm. And it's been my experience professionally, and I work, I work in sustainable design architecture. Oh, wow. Before my end music, I, <laughs> I studied with Donald Jacobs at the Chicago Symphony. Oh, wow, tuba. wonderful. He's like and the he, greatest breathing person ever. Yeah. It was an amazing place. Oh, he, my gosh. He was, he, well, he was back in Fritz Reiner's days yeah. when. when Chicago Symphony's brass section was the best one in the world. Oh, yeah. And I took my, I remember at the time, my $5,000 Miraflone tuba that I bought by selling my MGB. And he's taken on train. Wow. And he lived in the south side of Chicago in the basement. He had all of these devices he could try for learning how to breathe. And wow. he had people coming from all over the world, non instrumentalists, most of the singers. Singers, right? Yeah. How to breathe. Yeah. And he had emphysema. Wow. 
which is why he had to learn how to play tuba with very little lung capacity. So it was an amazing story. Yeah. Those are my music days. I evolved into architecture, building, sustainability. Uh, and I must say, in, in that profession, what has defined my 50 years in that area has been an appreciation how everything really does work together. In order to get high performance buildings, you have to get everything woven together, much like a musical performance. Wow. And this comes from a profession that typically had separate trades, mm -hmm. separate professional realms. Everybody did their own thing. Mm -hmm. And if you did your own thing according to the code, the building would be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, as we try to extract ever more performance out of every fewer materials, mm -hmm. the big lesson during my lifetime has been you really have to understand how it all works together, even sustainability now. Mm -hmm. It's not so much you all building individual homes that can sustain themselves. Mm -hmm. The goal is to set up the infrastructure so that, for example, you, I don't want everybody to have individual electric solar on their own home. I want to be part of the grid so mm -hmm. when you're not using it, you can use it. Mm -hmm. oh. And it seems to me, this has been kind of a gestalt of, yeah. of I don't know, at least in my lifetime, where a, a need to appreciate everything is woven. Because if you change one thing, it changes all these other there are these cascading influences. And I don't, as an educator, I don't know how you get people to understand that. Because yeah. a whole lot of that is about living life and paying attention. So I'm. Uh, I'm impressed with this. Was you, was you you were starting off focusing on youth, on young people? Yeah. Was it was it your sense that some of these things happen more naturally for a kid than it does for adults? Yeah, I, I think so. And is it, is sure. it because of wear and tear in our systems and we well, start kind of? It's from around? it's from habits more. That's the you know the inhibit the habitual response it's mostly mm -hmm. from habits so children just haven't had the time to develop all these habits that get in the way of their natural poise mm -hmm. so they're they're poised their head is like sitting on the top of their you know it's sitting slightly forward yeah. <laughs> of the ao joint yeah. and it's it's different when we've subjected ourselves to all this rigidity and, and the pressure, like I think once kids get into elementary school, especially Stress, they you know, kindergartners are having a whole bunch of homework now, mm -hmm. and then of course with the pandemic and virtual kindergarten, and it's just it's it's yeah, it, it puts a, a lot of pressures on Isn't the human more body. Social pressure that changes. Right. Well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's probably a huge. Part I think of about it. all the tall kids who start kind of coming down to where the people. Yeah. Are. I don't think that's physical. I think that's social. Yeah, and it's also fascinating to me. I, I talked to my Alexander Technique teachers about the time period when he was starting out with this. It, you know, it was like around the turn of, of the 20th century. Our society held themselves differently then than they do now. Of course, they didn't. They didn't have this problem, mm -hmm. but they were just really rigid. And you know, they would. I look at old photographs, black and white photos from the 19 aughts and it's in the middle of the summer and they're wearing like long dresses and top hat and you know, no. like no. that was just the society, like you look like this all the time. So it was, it's, it's fascinating that the way he described what to do, it's still kind of, it applies now, but he's probably thinking of a neck free as mm -hmm. something different than the way we have to think of the neck free now. Because th this posture may have been more like like this really mm -hmm. rigid head, like I know what I'm doing and I speak properly. Yeah, if you look at the photos that they would have had from that time yeah. period and they're just very they're just yeah. Well they had to stand still a long time for a photo <laughs> too. True. Part of it. But true. yeah, they were they were maybe rigid in a different way than we tend to be now. Uh -huh. And their furniture wasn't what we have now too, for better or worse. <laughs> like actually a lot like for Alexander Technique lessons you need a good, like solid flat chair and th these are actually pretty good for folding chairs but like one time those wooden old chairs that just literally an l shape those are the best for that and so much of our modern furniture is like perfect for <laughs> the slumping and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah 
exactly. It's kind of hard to practice what you need to do on, on a chair that won't allow you to sit up straight in cars. And I, don't, it, it's, it, I find furniture fascinating now, too. It's like this has opened up this whole world of like looking at how our society handles different things. It's wild. Well, I have another question that yeah. has to do with uh, interactions between performer yeah. and audience. I was thinking about that when you were talking about yin and yang. Can you have a performance without anybody? And I was thinking oh, about that as I walked in. I thought, well, if there's no one here and you're just you're talking. Yeah, that's a good yeah. question. It's all bad for well, we're, we're talking to Well, we have Facebook, Facebook Live on. No, so. that's fine. <laughs> But let me, let me take it one step further because part of what I worked in, I worked in acoustics fairly extensively. Oh, cool. And the notion was, well, the cushions in these chairs serve multiple purposes, <laughs> not just for yourself. Oh, but yeah. It's yeah. to create the illusion someone is sitting there. So uh, it's more of an issue for large performance groups. I'm curious in chamber music, is it less, is our acoustics less of an issue? because it's a more intimate environment. I was thinking about this last week because I went to one performance up at Egg Harbor. Mm -hmm. The Crest Pavilion. Uh, no, not Crest Pavilion, the other one. The, the Woodwalk Gallery? Where, I'm going to see you guys tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, Woodwalk. Woodwalk. Uh, and then last time I went over to um, the uh, UCC Church over here in Sturgeon. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, yeah. and had that vertical and it, it, you could tell when you were in there that it was, there was a little bit of dying going on at the acoustics at the back. Mm -hmm. Is it usually not much of an issue when you can play in all the different venues in these different places yeah. that are so well, very I, different? That's one of the most fun things about playing at Midsummer is because we usually play the same program several times in total totally different venues yeah. and not, we don't always rehearse in the venue too so it's interesting you just go out there and play and you're like oh and, you, and, if, and if it's a more live venue you often have to if it's a fast movement play a little bit slower tempo so that you can hear better and maybe put longer pauses between things and if it's a drier sounding space then you can get away with the faster tempo and, and it's really interesting how, how can you perceive it as the performer? Oh yes, yeah. Maybe more so with chamber music than like a big, a bigger ensemble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's it's a fun it's a fun challenge <laughs> to play in the. I, I love it. I mean, I've I've never been to another festival where we get to do that, and in like in the Milwaukee Symphony, where we have this amazing hall. It's it's fantastic, but we're like almost always just playing in that hall now. How is the new hall? It's really great. Yeah, we're very lucky to have it. And occasionally we'll do run out. And it was concerts. designed for an orchestra. Correct? Well, it was the 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 audience portion of the hall was designed as a movie theater in okay. 1930, and then they, they built. Um, it's down the street from the Riverside. Actually, oh, it was okay. the Warner Grand Theater. Right. Yeah, and now it's the Bradley Symphony Center. Not in there yet. Okay. Yeah, it's really awesome. But yeah, but they, they built the whole stage and the shell, all that's modern, and that was designed for an orchestra. But the acoustician we were working with is, is working with the space of the audience, and which was you know original to 1930. They tried to restore everything. And then the shell kind of has to visually match that and sort of complement the, the 1930 art architecture, and then work you know, acoustically as well. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Should well, we sign off on Facebook? We should sign off on Facebook. Is everybody still there? <laughs> We've had people Thanks for joining us. us. Yeah. Do you want to say anything else, Noah? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye.